Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm the Chief Executive of I Agree. I'd like to thank you all for joining our September lunchtime lecture. Today, I'd like to welcome James Croxford, who is an engineering lecturer from Harper Adams University. James is a chartered engineer and also a past student of Harper Adams, where he graduated from back in 2011. Previous to his teaching role, James has worked for the Shanghai Automotive Corporation for two years as a performance engineer and also spent seven years with Bentley Motors in their design analysis and test department. Today, James is going to take us through some of the latest simulation tools and techniques and how these can remove numerous iterations from the design process, thus saving companies both time and money. James will also discuss the growth of co-simulation packages which allow multi-domain simulations and interactions to be modelled and understood. Just before James starts, you're all currently muted. If you would like to ask questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute you so you can ask in person. Okay, so over to you, James. Excellent. So yeah, so I'm, I'm here um, today to kind of uh, just give my thoughts really on um, on simulation led design, what it is, um, you know, why we care, um, where it's uh, and where it might go next, I guess, and perhaps where where we should draw the line um, between, you know, exclusively simulation and um, and the physical world. So um, a bit about me, but uh, Charlie, thank you for that introduction. That was great. Um, so, yeah, I graduated from uh, an obscure place called Harper Adams University um, back in 2011. Um, with uh, having completed the off-road vehicle design degree, um, including a placement year at Bentley Motors, which was where I then went back to um, as a graduate and stayed there for, for a number of years, um, really focusing there on road load data collection and simulation using the data that we, that we gathered. Um, so that's kind of where I became familiar with some of the software packages I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and uh, yeah, that, you know, that's kind of where I, I got used to it and um, kind of kept those links, I guess, with those software companies and, and kind of, you know, ignited my, uh, my passion for, for simulation. Um, I did do a brief stint following that um, at uh, SAIC, better known as Shanghai Motors, um, split my time kind of between Longbridge and Shanghai. Um, but uh, I was, I'm sure you're aware that that has kind of wound up now, um, unfortunately. Um, but as that was happening, I was lucky enough to be offered a position back home, completing the circle. Um, so I've now been at Harper Adams for, uh, for this will be my third year, um, which has kind of flown by and with all the restrictions and things that have been in place for the last couple of years, feels like it's been forever as well. So um, yeah, kind of, you know, strange, strange warping of time there, but it's, it's nice to be back. Um, what I will say at the start is I'm, I'm going to use a lot of examples here about Altair. Um, I'm, I'm not a rep for Altair. I have no particular um, sort of favoritism towards, uh, towards Altair as a software company, um, but I, I do happen to think they're very good. Um, but it's software that I used when I was at Bentley and it's software that by fluke I've come back to using now we're at Harper. So there are other companies that do this just as well, um, but Altair is, is gonna form the, the bulk of the examples today just because it's what I've got access to and it's what I'm used to. Um, I went to uh, an academic showcase conference that, uh, that Altair held um, back in 2019 when we could actually see people uh, face to face. Um, and was quite surprised talking to people there. There was a lot of um, people in education there and there was a lot of industry people and recruiters there as well. Um, and the real feeling that came out of that room was, um, you know, students will go for interviews and, and they'll talk about, you know, they've done this fantastic piece of FE analysis or this, you know, this great piece of simulation. And, um, and the recruiters were saying like, they might as well come into the room and boast that they know F equals MA. You know, it's, it's just assumed that if you're doing an engineering degree, you can do simulation and, and even some of the optimization studies, which to, to my mind was still quite new and revolutionary, um, they said already has become kind of, well, we, ex we expect you to be able to do that. Um, and it, it kind of shocked me into realizing that actually just in the two or three years that I've not been doing this, you know, the speed it is moving on um, is, is, is staggering. Um, 
and I thought, right, well, we need to keep on top of this as a, as a university. So I kind of delved back into the simulation world and was like, right, you know, what's actually happening? What is the cutting edge simulation? And I guess, what should we be teaching our students? Um, so from there, we got a trial license um, to, to see what we could implement. And we've had a full campus rolled out last summer. So we've just completed uh, our first full academic year. Um, so some of the examples that I'll be using today are student examples. Um, whilst it's not okay for students to plagiarize, it's perfectly fine for staff to plagiarize. So that's absolutely fine. Um, so I will sort of be using some student examples as well, just to kind of illustrate my points. So I guess if we start, you know, with, with the basics, what, what is simulation and design? What does it mean? What do we, you know, what comes to mind when we say that? Um, and I think, you know, historically, by which I mean sort of the last four or five years, I'm not, not way back in history. Um, I think simulation to, simulation led design, excuse me, is optimization and uh, and using your sort of FE tools in a slightly different way. And, and you, you can set up these simulations to kind of do the heavy lifting for you, if you like, you know, sort of do the a lot of the design work for you. Um, and it can save an awful lot of time um, and, and consequently money um, and, a, and a huge amount of iterative um, design loops. So we'll just go into that a bit more and, and, you know, a standard process, and certainly this is how everything worked at Bentley, was the, um, you would have all your concepts, you would start pulling those together and then you would come up with a designing CAD, you know, you would have your part owners, your, you know, your design engineers, and they would come up with, um, with their initial design in CAD. They might have access to do some analysis to it, um, but the tools weren't really embedded at that stage. So they typically sent their design to the analysts team who had specialist software to do this. And that was uh, where I sat. Um, and then you get into this never ending loop of the, the analyst team will, will do some uh, analysis on the design, send it back. The designer wasn't happy with the results, so they'd argue with you for a bit. Then the, you know, the part would be too heavy, so you'd take some material out. Then it wouldn't be stiff enough, so you'd put some stiffening in. But then, because you'd stiffened it, stresses had gone up, and you kind of went round and round and round in these loops. Um, and it used to take forever before you eventually got to a design that that worked, met all the criteria, and you could take it forward to, you know, the next stage of the process, whatever that was. Um, Simulation led design basically puts the analysis before the design as kind of as daft as that sounds. And really the, these optimization studies are setting up your FE analysis in a similar way. So you have your constraints, you have your load cases and you set the, you set a target. So it could be a mass target, it could be a stiffness target. It, it assumes you want to keep the stresses under the um, the yield stress of your material, but you can override that if you need to keep lower stresses for fatigue purposes or whatever. Um, but there's no geometry in that uh, simulation. So you set up all the constraints, all the kind of wider aspects, and then the simulation will grow you apart. It will it will put the material where the material needs to be to meet those constraints that you've put in. So the design you get at the end of it is you know already meets all those criteria. And then you can you know, go on to do a, a verification and, and take it forwards. Um, you do end up with some very organic looking shapes potentially. So you know, this often gets um, linked in with the kind of rapid prototype um, manufacturing techniques. Um, or you take the results of that optimization study and then maybe tweak them to make them manufacturable using traditional methods, hence needing a verification bit just at the end. Um, but really, rather than all this toing and froing and, and doing an analysis as a, as a check to see how your design performed, you set the constraints and, you know, effectively the computer gives you the answer. I appreciate there's a sort of level of danger there, um, and we'll, we'll touch on that in a moment, but, but that's the principle. And I think to most people, that is what simulation-led design kind of means. Um, there are some, you know, it's, it's not it's not perfect. It's very good for structures. Um, it's very good for, you know, sort of, I don't know, suspension, levers, brackets, you know, anything kind of structural. 
um, it actually works very, very well, assuming you can go on to manufacture the shape it, it churns out. Um, but it doesn't work for every scenario. Um, and, you know, some simulations obviously require geometry first um, or interact with other things that you perhaps can't control. You know, I think it would be quite difficult, for example, to do any sort of aerodynamic simulation without some understanding of the geometry you know that that, it, that you need to work around or at least some packaging constraints or something you know you, you can't just um put in an aerodynamic target and say go because there isn't enough information there so sometimes you know it, it, it sort of fundamentally doesn't quite work um although i'm sure people are trying to develop ways around this because of the time and the and the effort that it that it could solve that it, you know could save um it also requires you knowing your load cases and your constraints um, and everything else because you know as with all um computer uh you know simulation type stuff if you put rubbish in you're going to get rubbish out um and you know it's not always easy to have precise exact load cases um that cover all eventualities and you can argue that you have the same problem in a normal fe simulation as well um but it's much more difficult to kind of build in safety nets or safety factors or things when you're doing it the other way around. So, so the load cases and the constraints become, I think, even more important. Um, and I think consequently, you know, the challenge really with this becomes not just taking the, the numbers as gospel. Don't, you know, you, it'd be very, very easy to just go, well, the computer said this, you know, it must, must be right. Um, and certainly when we're teaching students, um, you know, that is that is the temptation, you know, but I've, I've put the numbers in and it's 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 given me that. What do you mean? It's not right. Um, and, you know, you need a you need a, a good feel for those numbers as well. Um, you know, is, is it does it look plausible um, and, you know, and, and challenge the results? Don't just, you know, take what it gives you and say, yep, yeah, it's perfect. Um, so that's something we really kind of need to, you know, to to not lose focus on. I think simulation-led design is, is a bit more than that though. Um, I titled this slide, Do More Earlier. We have a bit of a, a catchphrase um, amongst our students that whenever they start to complain about workload, we just tell them to do more faster um, and then it'll all be fine. Um, so I've kind of pinched that catchphrase and you know, do more earlier. Um, and, and I think, simulation led design kind of fits into that really I, you know it's it's more than just that optimization um you know and i sort of think well it, you know, what we need is is more people doing more simulation more of the time um but how do we do that what do we need to kind of facilitate that um and i think we need better access to the simulation software you know it rather than have it as it maybe historically was just sat in a separate department this you know phenomenally expensive and specialist software um you're ruling out a huge portion of your design engineers before you even start um so better access to this software but also making it more accessible and you know through the interface and having intuitive controls um i can remember you know when when i started using these um I did have a graphical interface. I mean, I did a bit of having to go in and edit the deck through text files, and there were pages and pages and pages of code that you had to kind of dig through to, to set up what you wanted. Fortunately, I didn't do a lot of that. Um, but the graphical interface that I were using were layers and layers of menus, and you could never find the variable you wanted to change. Um, and, and you know, and it was they were awful, frankly. Um, and I dare say a damn sight better than they'd been you know five or ten years previous to that um but it has been accepted i think that that these you know these sorts of specialist softwares are, are need to be open to more people and there's been a huge push in the last few years to really bring them in line with any other program you know and make them intuitive and give them some proper icons and a menu bar you know like the ribbon across the top when you have microsoft word or excel or whatever you know take that kind of a, an approach that people are familiar with um and you know try and make this software actually usable um 
one of the things Altair have done is they've made um, a ribbon across the top, so, uh, sort of a la Microsoft, um, and they've split it down in order. So, you know, the first menu is all about assembly, so where you bring your parts in and you put them together. The second menu is all around the geometry and does it need tidying up or defeaturing? Um, then you move into mesh and elements and connectors, and it steps you through the process you need to go through. Um, and it literally just runs from left to right. Um, and it, it's very, very easy to follow. You don't miss a bit. You know, you, if you just follow the icons in order, you have your constraints, you have your loads, you've checked your mesh, you've done your mesh quality studies, you've validated the uh, model before you've run it. Um, and this really hit home for me um, about three years ago now. I started to do some um, uh, aerodynamic work, some CFD studies. Never done it before. Um, opened up a package and was like, right, this is going to take me weeks to learn, but here we go. Um, and I brought in my CAD model and worked my way through this, this menu system, worked my way through the, um, the icons in order, got to the very end, and the last icon was run. And I thought, well, well all right then, I'll you know, hit run. I went, oh, God, it worked. I got an answer. The answer was rubbish. It was complete nonsense, but it but it got me into the software. Now I think that's brilliant and extremely dangerous um, in equal measures. It took me, you know, no idea about using CFT software, but it got me into it very very quickly. But obviously I hadn't set it up right. I didn't understand all the variables I was playing with, and so it gave me complete, you know, nonsensical answers. So what I did with that was I go right back to basics. You know, I'm going to put a wedge in a wind tunnel. Does it do what I think it's going to do? Or I'm now going to put two wedges in a wind tunnel, one behind the other, you know, and, and you you sort of build it up and you gain confidence in it and you know you, you understand where you went wrong. Um, but that I think is still critical, you know, rather than as I said, the potential danger with all of this, which is just press buttons, press buttons, oh well, it ran, so it must be correct. Um and I think with that in mind and that kind of, you know, well, actually, this is much more accessible. It's much easier to use than it ever has been before. But um, you get to this question of, well, do we still need physical testing? Well, I think yes, for now, for exactly those kind of reasons. However, is it essential long term? Well, if you can get some models, you can validate them, you can iteratively improve them. You know, you could certainly reduce testing in the future. Could you remove testing in the future? I think is an open debate, and we'll we'll come back to that at the end because I think it's an interesting question. Um, I've just put a couple of examples there. I know F one um, one could argue they're driving around in prototypes all the time, I suppose, but you know, there's very little prototyping or testing. It's all virtual for F one. Um, partly within the rules and the budget cap regulations and so on, but also the, just for time and for turnaround, um, they, you know, they don't have the time or the ability to make prototypes of everything. So it's, it's hugely virtual. Um, and that is obviously at the, you know, the top end of technology. So could we do a similar thing? Maybe. Um, and the other one, which I, I came across this example a couple of years ago, which I think is really interesting is Ironbird. So, Airbus, um, I mean, they're not the only ones, Boeing and whoever else would all do the same, but um, to certify a new aircraft, um, Airbus make what they call an Ironbird, and it's a full scale layout of all the hydraulics, all the electrics in space, in you know, real size, real time, it's, it's physically there. Um, and they do all their certification testing on this. And, you know, you can see from that picture, it's, you know, it's huge. I dread to think what it costs, um, and it's and it's purely for certification testing. So when they did the A thrifty A three fifty nine hundred, alongside the physical Ironbird, they made what they called a virtual Ironbird, and they replicated this virtually alongside the physical thing. And they, as they were going through the certification process, everything they did physically, they did virtually as well. And when it got to the end they were basically told that actually, yes, that model would have sufficed for a virtual certification. 
So they were looking to remove this huge, expensive, complicated exercise of making a physical iron bird um, and do all of their testing and all of their certification through, through virtual, through simulation means. Now, they've obviously been through a program to iterate that, develop that, you know, they've, they've gained confidence in it as they've been going through. Um, and I think, you know, with, a, with a, a sort of dispassionate engineering head on, it's probably a very sensible thing to do. Um, would you get in a plane that's not had physical testing done on it? But I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but they're the sort of things that are, you know, are possible and I think are coming. And I think we need to start the debate as to how far do we want to go with all this simulation stuff. So that's some of the, the early stuff. And, and I think this is now we're sort of into, well, actually, how else can simulation led design help? What do we mean by, you know, how wide does this go? Because I think your optimization and removing your physical testing, you know, yeah, cool. We all like that. But I think simulation led design is more than that. Um, and it really it allows proper investigations and what I would call like engineering playing of subsystems. Um, they can be entirely virtual, they can be pretty low risk, um, and you can sort of, you know, really develop and refine aspects um, of, of an existing design without having to go near any um, physical prototyping or anything like that. So here are some of the student projects that I sort of promised you at the start. So um, this uh, William Hooks, one of our master's students, um, just graduated and he um, was using EDEM, which is a piece of software that's discrete element modeling and it models um, bulk materials, basically. So, um, you know, so soil, seeds, straw, mud, all, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and he used it to um, design and evaluate two new seed shoots for a Stanhope Web Precision Seed Drill. Um, and it was cabbage seeds and carrot seeds, particularly that he was looking at. And he, you know, specified the dimensions of, of the seed and the properties of that, and was able to come up with a, a range of different um, different seed drills uh, or seed shoots, sorry, and understand exactly how they work, what the difference is, and and you know do a complete redesign of that aspect of the um, of the drill without ever you know leaving his computer. Um, it does say they're presenting at the um, International Conference of Agenda next month. I actually wrote this slide a couple of months ago for something else. So I, that event has actually happened. I think some of you may have, if you were attended that conference, you may well have seen more of this. Um, but we've had other things as well. So, you know, uh, James Shaw, another one of our master students was looking at anaerobic digestion pellet spreading patterns um, and how they can be uh, improved and optimized and actually what's going on and control the, you know, the flow of the, um, of the seed, the speed of the spreading arms, all that kind of thing, you know, and, and what effect does it have? And really do these very, very detailed investigations um, quickly, cheaply, um, or, or relatively quickly, quicker than probably building a load of prototypes, um, you know, and, and make some huge improvements on the design, um, you know, purely in a, in a virtual world. Um, and another one, Hugh Smith, and this might be a video, yep, yeah, there we go. Um, looking just at, at uh, soil tilts in a field, um, expanding on previous research that had been done in this area. And um, he was recovering um, strain in the actual arm of the tine as well. Um, and rather than having to go and strain gauge a load of tines and do a load of physical experiments, um, which he actually wasn't able to do because of the COVID restrictions, he actually found that he could A, do it virtually, and B, it gave him much more control, much more repeatability, and he could do a lot more simulations, trying and testing all these different things far quicker than he would have been able to in, in real life. So it actually kind of worked in his favour, albeit, you know, he was a bit uh, a bit peeved when, um, when the COVID restrictions didn't enable him to do what he thought he was going to do in the first place. So I've grabbed a few of these examples then from the Altair website. We haven't, um, I haven't got all of these, so, so full disclosure, these aren't my, uh, my work, but I think they give some um, really interesting examples, again, of that kind of, you know, detailed investigations that you can do um, in, a, in a simulation world. And, you know, this, this is all from uh, within a combine harvester. So, you know, you can look at um, 
grains falling through uh, falling through the sieves. And if you were to you know space out the the veins or you know change the flow of the the grain, the speed of it, whatever how does you know how does it fall where does it go you can work out what mass of grain is going through um, and going into the, the bottom bin or going off the end whatever it is um, in the bottom left there you can look at um, velocity or mass flow rate of grain um, and you know and it doesn't have to be grains you can model using the this, like flexible straws you know you can model um, straw through cutting heads or straw walkers or whatever it is um, and do these these little investigations. I also saw a, an interesting um, simulation. Couldn't find any pictures of it, unfortunately. But um, people talking about a simulating potato harvester um, and grading capability and how you set up um, everything inside that to, to grade the potatoes appropriately. But also you can track the forces on any individual grain by which I mean potato if you scale it appropriately um, and you could get um, average and peak forces on the crop um, and you know cumulatively over its trip through the harvester and actually redesign it to reduce crop damage um, again all in an entirely virtual world so I think you know this is where the power of simulation really kind of comes in um, you know, and you can you can make these quite radical changes or at least investigate them, you know, relatively simply. But I think there's even more than that. And this is where um, the the really new cutting edge simulation starts to um, to come through. Um, and and this is where you get multi domain simulation. Um, now, maybe this does go back to needing some more specialist um analyst engineers and it would also be kind of probably cross-functional within a company so there's a bit of logistics of how you would do this within a company but rather than an individual designer focusing on their element you can set up these much more wide-ranging simulations so here we've got um an excavator being simulated and the um the arm of the excavator has been set up using an fe package so you can recover stresses in the arm but the material that it's digging has been set up using EDEM. So we don't actually need a load case for the end of the arm because we've specified the material that it's digging. Um, and, you know, and the two will run in parallel. So hopefully this video will also work. So you can either visualize the results and just, you know, do the, the sort of dynamic mechanics, you know, how does it all work? You can recover stresses in real time or sort of pseudo real time in the arm and then very very simply we can change the material properties what are we digging you know is it iron ore is it coal is it sand what is it and see how that affects the stresses in the machine itself so we can start to combine different aspects um you know and and link all of these bits and pieces together so rather than have somebody just trying to design the arm and say, well, you know, under that load case, it's fine. Actually, very quickly now, we can put a load of different load cases in. We can make the material wetter. We can, I don't know, do this that, and the other and see what impact it has. And we can take it even further. So this is an um, eight by eight off-road vehicle. Um, and we can, we can model this using this kind of co-simulation multi-physics idea. Um, we can model the suspension using the standard sort of FE um, tools that we've got. Um, we can put a steering system in, we can put a traction control system in. So we could put a, a, an active steering system in and some steering control. We can model a traction, traction control system, um, driveline controls. And we already know that we can model soils or you know, off-road type surfaces and we can put all of those together and run a simulation that um, allows us to you know, see, will this vehicle perform over this particular off-road terrain? And obviously the uncontrolled system at the bottom there, you know, no, it gets, it gets stuck, gets to the first lump and gets stuck. And you can see from the, uh, from the graph in the bottom left, vehicle speed, that after five seconds, the vehicle stopped and there's no speed left. But under the controlled system with the variable torque, whenever it can clamber over the um, can clamber over that scenario fine and we can try that with different um, 
different soils we can go sand or mud or gravel or I don't know whatever the off-road surface is and we can tune our traction control system based on the um, the surface that we're running over um, and start to link all of that together whilst at the same time seeing what impact that has on the suspension components and we can recover the stresses again in that sort of pseudo real time in each suspension component whilst we're doing it so does controlling the torque through my traction control model mean i've got more load going through one or other of my suspension components does it give me a different hot spot do i now need to look at that in terms of fatigue and we can really start to investigate all these interactions between systems and all these links in a way that certainly wasn't possible virtually a couple of years ago and i think would actually be quite difficult to do to do physically as well um, if it wasn't just a case of well we do it and we you know we do a test and we sort of see what happens um, so i think this is where the, the power then of you know this multi physics and, and co-simulation is um, you know there's a huge opportunity here to start linking these bits together and do these really detailed investigations um, and just get a much better understanding of what's going on. Because actually for me, that's where simulation is, is really helpful. You know, you can do lots of different bits and pieces. You can do lots of investigations and get a much better understanding as an engineer. Um, and I think that's where the power is, not this idea of, well, we put some numbers in and the computer does the maths for us and gives us an answer. I don't, I think that's missing the point. But then we can actually take it even further than that and even wider than that um, throughout the design process. Um, and we could start to have um, virtual design reviews. So this was something that just as I was leaving Bentley, they'd invested a, a huge amount in a, um, in a virtual reality cave, I think they call it. Um, and we can use simulation to look at the vehicle. You know, we can compare real parts that come in to what the simulation said they should be. Um, and we were, they were having the early concepts fully signed off virtually. You know, the styling, what does it look like? You can sit in the driver's seat from, a, from the driver's point of view. What can I see? What's the, the vision through the windows? Am I happy with how this looks and that looks? And, you know, and, and if anybody wants to make a change, it can be made very, very quickly and nobody has to leave the room to do it. So, you know, it's opening up this possibility of, of virtual design reviews, virtual sign offs, virtual gateways. Um, and outside of just the design as well, virtual manufacturing. You know, it's possible to simulate the production line. And so, you know, is it possible to make this component down this line? You know, where do I need to put my robots or my control? Or, you know, can I actually get that spanner in? Is there clearance for my torque wrench? Or is that bolt going to clash? Or, you know, what is it? You can actually build these things in real time, virtually, and try and head off a lot of these problems before they occur. So not only are you designing the product but you're doing the design for manufacture entirely virtually as well right down to pr production line layout you know you can track how far the operative would have to walk to get the tools get the bolts get everything they need and you know could can that be optimized so that you can increase the flow through your production line um, and all of these kind of you know bits lead into a, a you know a much more complete product um, because you can do so much more of this up front in the virtual world and and i know at the end of these sorts of presentations um you're supposed to ask me questions but i want to kind of pose a question back to you i want to pose a question back to the room really and it's you know how far through a design process should we go um in the virtual world only you know, are there concerns about this having everything virtual? Um, because I don't think we're a million miles off being able to do everything virtually right up until production. But the question is whether we should be doing that. Um, 
and and kind of what the rationale is you know i think it's it's nice to say oh, i want some physical testing because it makes me feel better but actually how accurate is our physical testing you know how repeatable is our physical testing probably not as repeatable as we'd like it to be um so you know where 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 should we draw the line if we should draw a line at all and i think is a, is an interesting and very active debate um what I'm going to do, just because I've got a few minutes left, Charlie, if this is all right, is um, just touch on another project that we're running, um, partly because it uses partly for these latest simulation techniques and partly because it's quite good fun. Um, and that's uh, Operation Pacemaker. So um, I'm part of a team that are um, looking to be the fastest cyclists in the world, basically, and I will, I'm not on the bike. I'm going to put that out there, first of all. Um, but a guy called Neil Campbell, um, has got it in his head he wants to be the first person to achieve 200 miles an hour um, on a push bike um, he currently has the men's world record at 174 miles an hour um, but is the overall world record held by a lady in the states is currently at 183 so we're looking to um, we're looking to break that using these latest simulation techniques and all this aerodynamic um, simulation so we've wrote some master students in last year and we're going to do the same again um, and the record basically allows um, the, the cyclist to slipstream behind a vehicle. So we therefore need a vehicle that does over 200 miles an hour. If anybody's got one, uh, please speak to me afterwards. Um, but we, we were lucky enough to be lent um, a Porsche Cayenne and we designed this kind of slipstreaming shelter to, to hang off the back of it. Um, and a GOM local company came and scanned the vehicle and scanned the shelter for us and, and put it into CAD and we were able to uh, to use the, the simulation techniques to really understand the aerodynamics of, of what was going on and, and you can see there the students did what I think is a very intelligent thing have started with some very simple shapes um, there's a thing called an Ahmed body um, which replicates um, a lot of the characteristics of a vehicle albeit being a very simple block. Um, so that was what they started with and then moved into um, some simple um, vehicle CAD and ultimately into the CAD that uh, we got scanned off the, the real life vehicle and shelter. Um, and, you know, by putting all this simulation work in and, and understanding exactly how the air um, flows over this vehicle and even if we can get the air to kind of loop around um, in like an eddy current and push the cyclist along that would be ideal um, but obviously in a stable enough air pocket um, that Neil isn't gonna gonna fall off um, so that's a challenge that we've kind of got ongoing um, at the moment um, and again I think is a, is a really good example of the sort of you know the boundaries you can push with this simulation and something that just wouldn't be possible without simulation because you know Neil is quite mad doing this cycling at 200 miles an hour but if we were to sort of say well we don't really know what's going to happen but you know on, on your pop and you know let us know um I, I don't think he'd do it you know so we're able to kind of walk through it virtually in a safe environment explain to Neil what he's going to expect um and you know I won't say mitigate the risk but you know kind of hopefully mitigate it as much as possible um and be able to push the project forward in a way that wouldn't have been possible without these you know really high-tech simulation packages so that is just um a few examples and uh, hopefully um you know hopefully you found that interesting um but i said i think you know it's the simulation led design is a huge topic um something that you know people kind of say well yeah, you know, do an optimization, do a bit of FE, it's all fine. There's, but there's so much more to it than that, so many more opportunities than that. Um, and I think it's, you know, really interesting to kind of debate, you know, how much we should be doing virtually versus how much, um, you know, we should stick to the traditional kind of physical test. Um, so I kind of refer back to that question of, you know, should we be drawing any lines where, um, you know where where should we draw the line between virtual and what should we keep as physical testing i think is a is an interesting open debate but um i'll grab a drink for a second and uh, yeah thank you for your thank you for your time thank you for listening thank you james um yeah before we just kick off on the questions i, I just um your question about how far 
And I suppose, you know, in my experience, it, it's really as far as you want, you know, what's the acceptable risk is what it comes back to. And that, that risk can be a financial risk of things going wrong. It can be a legislative risk that something's going to wrong. It could be a human risk, you know. And I suppose, you know, I, I've worked on projects that have had virtual sign-offs all the way through to the end. You know, no, no proper physical structural testing. You know, it's been done virtually. So I suppose it all comes back to the, the risk, you know. And I suppose if you're, you're designing aeroplanes that can fall out the sky, you know, they do an awful lot of virtual testing before they, they take something up in the air and see if it actually flies, don't they? So, well, I think for me, that's, that's an that's interesting the, one. Yeah, that's almost the paradox, I think, in, in that, you know, the, you don't build a prototype nuclear reactor just to see what happens. Um, you know, but then that means the more you're doing the virtual testing because it's dangerous, the more critical the virtual testing is. So how are you validating those models mm. without the physical testing that you've done, you know, and you kind of get caught in this catch 22 situation, whereas something that is far less risky. Great, do virtual testing, that's not a problem, but then it, it maybe didn't necessarily need it. So I don't know, you kind of get caught between, you know, between these conflicting, uh, mm. conflicting aspects. I think as well um, is sometimes the cost of physical testing. You know, it, it costs an awful lot of money to, to build prototypes to, and to do physical testing. It is cheaper to do simulation and get there, you know, sooner. But uh, whether you use it to sign the product off, that you know, comes back to the acceptable risk, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, OK, so I'll kick off the questions. Alan Plum, you've got the first question. Ah, OK. Thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, that's really interesting, James. Um, I've, I've also put a request in there about extending the topic into use for training. But before we come to that, um, it, my background is safety. So particularly interested in, have you been involved in any examples directly, particularly in relation to agriculture, if possible, um, where the techniques have been used for testing safety, not, not just in terms of safe design but also you know maintenance elements for example of uh, in-field maintenance that type of thing I can see uh, opportunities there for improving safety. Yes yeah, so, I mean I'm um, I'm a slight imposter today in the sense that I'm an automotive engineer so yeah. I've got minimal agricultural examples I'm afraid that, that I've worked. We won't on hold that against you James. No so. I'll <laughs> sneak out the back door at the end. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, certainly in the automotive world, um, they were, there were, you know, there's a lot of this crash testing and crash simulation and airbag simulation and, and all of that side of things. I'm not aware of anyone that has substituted the physical testing. Mm. Um, I think where it's, where it's been very uh, well used, um, and Bentley were quite a good example of this because obviously the cost of those vehicles they make, you know, as few as possible, and I'm sure that's applicable to everybody, um, but it just wasn't possible to crash a car and have it fail. You know, we, we had to, we, we had the same number of vehicles as legally required crash tests. So, you know, they were very much verification. So all the work was done virtually, but I'm not aware of anyone that's not done the physical work. I'm not sure in terms of crash it would actually be allowed at the moment. Um, mm. I think you know the 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 Airbus um, example. They did both. They did a sort of virtual and a physical certification. Um, I meant to check back in actually to see whether they what they did on their next because there is an A three eighty one A three fifty one thousand now. So I don't know what they did the next time around. Um, but I think your point about maintenance and, and service and that kind of thing is, yeah, absolutely, absolutely valid. Um, and, you know, it's there are real opportunities to rather than kind of um, accelerated durability testing using, you know, manufactured surfaces and, you know, corrosion and that kind of thing is, is run it in, it's going to sound silly, run it in real time, but sped up you know, actually run it over a surface a million times, but do it virtually overnight. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think, you know, there's this huge opportunity there. I, I mean, I would guess um, you might be able to answer this, Charlie, from your own background, but for example, um, designer safety cabs and so on, I guess a lot of work was done there to avoid wrecking too many tractors, if you like, the structure you could, you could model the structure easily enough. 
um, there's elements of protecting the operator within it during an overturn. There's, there's areas like that, there's recent fatality, you know, reinforcing the need for wearing seat belts. It's okay having a cab, but if you get rattled around inside it in, or get thrown out the door, you're not going to survive. So, um, yeah, there's plenty of opportunities. And, and I will just grab the moment wearing my Douglas Bonford Trust secretary's hat. Uh, great to see the names mentioned because they're all um, scholars that we've funded, including Will's presentation at the International Oh, Conference. great. Oh, okay. oh, I didn't know our, that. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned them. So our trustees will be exceedingly happy when I report back at our AGM in, in November. Thank you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, they're brilliant pieces of work that they've done. And I think we took a slightly different approach. Um, well, it was partly forced on us with COVID and everything else, but we've sort of made the software available and kind of, you know, it's just a run with it. Yeah. And the projects they've doing have really given them the drive to go away and investigate the theory. So rather than sit in lectures and have us just pile theory down their throats when they're not really listening, you know, <laughs> it's, it's made it very real and it's made them kind of go, I cannot understand why that's not working. Well, I better go and find out then, haven't I? And, you know, we've had as good, if not better, theory stuff presented mm. because we didn't teach them it as kind of counterintuitive as that sounds. Mm. Um, but now they've, they've done some superb projects. Oh, great outcome. Thank you. And the, the other impressive thing with, this, with the students is how quickly they can grasp the software. I think if I cast my mind back, you know, to my, my first experience of, of FE was back in the late 90s. Um, and it was incredibly difficult software to learn to use. You know, and the prerequisite of the training course was you need a degree in engineering, of course. But my God, it was hard work learning the software and, and remembering how to, to operate it was to, to learn it in a student, uh, in a period while the, the guys and girls are in education and to be able to produce stuff is, is impressive, isn't it? Um, my yeah, question- A lot of work has been done around that ability to pick it up and make it yeah. look like programs that people understand and this and the other. And, and it, yeah, you know, oh, it, a horrible, it, horrible piece of uh, pieces of software to use. Oh, always, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, but then obviously the you're, you know, you're potentially opening it up to people that don't quite understand mm. it. So I think again, there is yeah. a level of caution. It becomes quite dangerous. Yeah. Uh, my question was about uh, the, the geometry constraints. So I've seen computer-led design produce organic shapes, um, which are great if you can 3D print or cast them. But if your limitation is flat plate welded together in different shapes, how restrictive can you make um, the software? Can it can it be restrictive to certain rectangular shapes? You know, can it be that finely controlled, or is that too difficult? At, at the moment, I haven't seen anything that can be that finely controlled. I know it is something that you know the kind of manufacturability of it is very much the area under development. Um, yeah. There are, you know, there are quite a lot of um, thickness controls and, you know, things that you put in, but they still come out very organic looking. Yeah. Um, I th what, what I have seen more recently is ability within kind of the results viewer to manually tweak it here and there. Um, but then obviously oh. you're introducing the need for a validation loop, which kind of was the point of not doing it in the first place. Yeah, I suppose you could constrain it in a box shape, could you, that the component must fit in this rectangular shaped box? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 the global yeah. constraints are all are all there. So you can put your geometry constraints or, you know, I, I need to avoid this area because I've got a drive shaft going through yeah. there or, or whatever it is. Um, but the, yeah, the I need to make it out of six mil plate constraint. Mm. Um, from what I've seen, isn't isn't quite there yet. Right. But I know, okay. I know yeah. it's a common thing that people are, you know, are feeding back. So I'm, I have absolutely no doubt it's yeah. under development. Yeah, and I've seen some of the results. You know, and the, say the organic shape that comes out really raises a few eyebrows, and it'd be great to actually make one in that shape and see if it would work. But uh, really well, it's something we do with our final years actually. Yeah. They're not only small brackets, but we do 3D exactly print that, it, three D print it, and it doesn't yeah. work. And, um, yeah. And I, yeah, that it was a a um, a project very much along those lines that uh, generated a quote that's become fairly infamous around our students, which is, "God, do you know how strong steel is?" <laughs> um, you know, because it's uh, yeah, quite spindly things will uh, take a lot of load when you put it in the right place. Well, it's amazing how strong an M8 bolt is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
Um, David Clare, have you? Is that a question? I'm just sorry. I'm just catching up on the chat. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, uh, it's not really a, just a statement, question. Yeah. It's just a, a comment, really, that I've noticed uh, along with probably James and a few of us here. That uh, yeah, some good has sort of come out of of COVID. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of agricultural engineering companies, particularly smaller ones, who are not familiar with simulation, what you can do with them, and they're still doing a lot of physical testing. And hopefully, students joining these companies will persuade the management to say, well, rather than cutting metal, let's just do some more stuff on our computer first, optimize the design a bit and then do less testing in the future and less building of prototypes. You can spend a lot of money sort of building something, change it, test it, change it, test it, change mm -hmm. it, test it. If you can do it on a computer, you build it once and hopefully it will work first, first time. And, and as you build the experience, you may need, as James has, has questioned there, you might not need to actually test it. Absolutely, okay. Um, comment from David White. Um, and then David, Mr. Price, David Price, you have a question. Um, yeah. Hey, I've just got a, a question about the, the digital twin um, type models that you're yeah. looking at. Um, and basically how, you know, do, do you think they can become too cumbersome and too complex? Um, and also, you know, to, to keep them up to date regarding, you know, the overall vehicle mass, the weight distribution, the center of gravity, because a lot of the, you know, the forces and inputs that we have into excavators and things are all stability limited. You know, they can be hydraulic or stability limited, and that makes a big difference on the amount of force that's coming into it. So I know from just maintaining spreadsheets and things that we use to do stability calculations, maintaining accurate center of gravities as parts change, you know, if you have to swap out CAD models in the digital twin all the time and reset up contacts, I just I'm wondering whether, you know, it becomes this very sort of uh, labor intensive um, model to maintain. And then th the other sort of question I've got as well is if you then just want to make a change to, say, a radius or a well joint or something on a chassis, and then you have to rerun the, the whole digital twin model through the you know the the digging cycle that's massively computationally expensive so you know it's just a question how, how practical do you think they are yeah they it's a it's a, it's a great question that the full-blown digital twin um kind of aspect i th i think is we're not there yet for me i think you know i the i think the real power with what's available at the moment is this idea of sort of taking a subsystem and saying, right, I'm going to look at, you know, this, you know, the, the, the internals of a potato harvester and how I spread the rollers and do the grading and, and, and focus in on it as a, as an investigation, um, a, a full digital twin. I mean, yes, they take a huge amount of computational power. And, um, I was chatting to some, uh, guys from Amazon web service who do this kind of cloud-based solving, um, approach and, you know, you upload your model to them they use the amazon cloud which has got about four billion computer cores in it solve it and give it you back um and you know you just pay for the computing power that you use when you use it kind of pay as you go type service um and i think you you know it would have to be done like that i don't think it makes any sense for a you know individual companies to invest in the amount of processing power they would need to run full-blown digital twins depends on what product is i suppose to be fair um but yeah i think you know it's and your your point about updating them and keeping them relevant yeah i think if, if it can be fundamentally built in so if you've got a you know a centralized cad repository for example or something and you know you upload your parts you tend to check bits in and out don't you and, and that kind of thing if you, if you run on a system similar to, to what we did I think when that automatically interacts with a centralized either digital twin or a centralized analysis 
then then it will i think will start to pay benefits but if if you're asking people to yeah update your cad and update this model and do this and the other and you're getting lots of people all working on the same model it feels unlikely at the moment so i think there are going to have to be um or businesses are going to have to think about how they implement this because i do think it's the way it's going but i don't think we're yeah perhaps quite ready for it with the structures we've got around us yep okay thanks I'm not sure whether that answered the question or not dave but <laughs> so no, 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 just... i think i'm broadly agreeing with you yeah, yeah. i think okay i, I, I think, think you've got one oh, sorry no go on dave i was gonna say i've got one more question but i have played a little bit with with eden as well um but not very much um do you know how accurately they can model um you know soils like virgin soils if you like that are compressed to start with and then as you start digging through them they get looser rather than being something just like coal or iron ore which is just loose to start with that is it was a question that was raised to me actually a, a few weeks ago i haven't played with that the all the simulations i've done you, you create this factory and it sort of drops the material um yeah. and i think because it's the way it works is just contacts between between all the elements um I haven't seen it. You can set it up initially, I think, by putting your characteristics and your shear modulus and whatever else in there. But the evolution of that soil um, isn't something I've investigated directly at the moment, no. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I think the, uh, yeah, the reality is in some cases it is cheaper and quicker to build it and test it <laughs> than go through it. You know, it's, it just, I'm not going to ignore your question, Martin, but just jump into Niall's question now Piggott picks up on the cost of software that is that is a, a good question actually is the software is incredibly expensive and, it, and out of the reach of a lot of small companies Neil do you, Niall do you want to comment or has he disappeared well hello can you hear me yes hello everybody um yeah I've done a wee bit of um solid work simulation uh but um getting the time to accurately uh, describe your load cases and evaluate it uh, i'm doing I, I like most engineers within small companies i am wearing a lot of hats and to uh i'd love to dig deeper into simulation but time is a constraint uh and i I see the way that simulation is being driven uh, on the horizon and it's to be welcomed. Um, but I'm delighted to see the Harper students uh, and their projects and the way they are developing in a whole host of different areas, it's to be applauded. Uh, and I think with the uh, democratization of simulation, it's brilliant, it really is, and I, I, I welcome it with open arms. But the time to uh, uh, invest in getting beneficial results out, I find at this moment in time, with my experience, it's a bit of an obstacle. And I'm hoping to change that, uh, but that's where I'm coming from at, the moment, at this moment in time. Uh, and I'd like to thank James for his presentation, very interesting. And uh, it's a, that Altair software is software I have come across briefly, but uh, it's certainly food for thought. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Niall. And I think um, I, I think you're right. You know, it's if it's particularly for 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 small businesses. I obviously don't know your background, but it, it you know the time. Um, to invest in really, you know, getting to grips with all this. And, you know, also the licenses are very expensive. Um, no getting away from that. Um, you know, I think it is up to, to individual companies to say, well, actually, what level of physical testing and prototyping is it likely to save me? And, you know, can you offset the cost one way or another? Um, and it, it's not going to be right for everybody. I, th I think there is a... Um, or certainly Altair are, are moving to this kind of... Um, I can't think what they call it, tokens, I think they call it, but you sort of buy a, a license and it gets you access to all these different bits of software packages, but only like certain ones at certain times. So you only have to pay for sort of one license, but you get 30 programs, so long as you don't open more than one at a time. 
Um, so that they're, they're trying to make it more flexible and you know more um, more accessible, um, but it is still very expensive. Um, I could do a shameless plug, couldn't I, and say if you've not got the time, maybe you hire a graduate who already knows it, and you'll be you'll be well on the way. On mute. Uh, Martin, last question, then I better draw it to a close because we're just about one o'clock. Thank you, Charlie. No, I, I was just interested in asking you what I've posted as a question. Um, have you come across Bentley software, um, mainly auto type and auto plant? And the reason for that is in your uh, sort of uh, steps through layout from concept through to design and CAD to FEA analysis, you know, there's a clear example. Um, there's like where I work, we have uh, AutoCAD obviously, and, and then there's Bentley Autotype. So there's stuff drawn in AutoCAD first, and then it's it's like modeled uh, in Autotype, Bentley Autotype. So it's, um, you know, being checked for the uh, design stresses within that. So I'm just, just wondering, um, have you come across these packages and uh, your point of view about the simulation packages being maybe not as well iconed as like AutoCAD or uh, other packages is a good point. Um, I would sort of agree with what you said there. So I'd just like to ask that. Yeah, it's, um, I haven't come across uh, those programs actually, no. Um, but I will look into them because I'm always interested to see how different different programs tackle things slightly differently, don't they? Um, but um, yeah, I've, I've, bizarrely, I've used AutoCAD very little. I've, I've bounced from companies that have used Katia or Pro Engineer and now SolidWorks. I somehow seem to have dodged AutoCAD completely. Um, but um, but I think the you know the um, the interface and the kind of iconing um, within these programs. It, it, or to me, it feels like if you know what you're doing and you understand the sort of the menus and the icons, then it's fine. Um, but I don't think they were ever designed for a wider audience. And to be fair, why would they be? You know, they, they, it was analysis software for analysis engineers. You know, it, it wasn't a requirement when these things were first made. Um, but I think now that, you know, that the penny's starting to drop that, you know, maybe we need more than half a dozen analysts in the corner able to access this sort of stuff. Um, and, and as Niall was saying, you know, the certainly the old interfaces would take, you know, a huge amount of time to get fully up to speed with. Um, so I think someone's kind of thought, well, we probably need to do something about this. And some programs were better than others. And, you know, some may not need a huge amount of um, adaption. Um, but certainly some of the ones I used in the early days, and I'm sure Altair won't mind me quoting them themselves they were awful you know <laughs> so, um, much better now okay. though i'll say in their defense okay thank you okay i'll draw it to a close because we're just a little bit over um, so thanks james excellent presentation there uh, really interesting thanks for taking the time out to do that uh, lots of lots of uh, good comments in the chat i'm sure people found it really interesting uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and hope you'll join us for our next lecture on the 12th of October, where we'll be joined by IAGRI member John Baines, who is going to talk to us about some of the latest technology being applied in the dairy industry. Uh, just before we close, I'd like to plug our conference, Future Fuels in Agriculture, which is going to be held online on the 3rd of November. We've got a great lineup of speakers from in and around the industry, so please Go and have a look on the website, check it out, and more importantly, book your place. And also, please share with your colleagues who may be interested. It's not just about machine fuels, it's about how fuel can be a product from the land as well. So all that's left to say is thanks again to everybody for joining, and see you next time. Bye-bye.